Now, uh, this is a quite a delicate question. Uh, it's a question on which the scriptures have some uh, large amount of uh, material. And uh, it's also a question uh, on which our day is very divided. And uh, so to treat it in a, an hour's time and especially to give the opportunity for uh, exchange discussion is really quite a challenge. Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, I am uh, Homer Payne. I have been working with OM for about 15 years and uh, I have been married for going on 42 years. Uh, we have uh, three children of our own. We lost four on the way. Uh, we try to adopt two more, uh, and uh, my wife was raised in a home where uh, the father was absent a great deal of the time, and where the wife, the mother, was really responsible for the spiritual life and the discipline of the home. Uh, she grew up and came into a mission where we were married, where she was also more or less second in command. Uh, I was raised in another kind of a home, an authoritarian Victorian home where my father was very uh, strong figure and uh, when he said jump everybody shouted with one voice how far and uh, so when we were married at 30 years of age why obviously you can see uh, we had uh, some problems of adjustment and I suppose that uh, this was with a view to helping others who would have the same problems. As Paul says that the comfort that God gives us in our sufferings we have to share with others. And I have been around quite a little. I don't think I'm any great uh, authority, but I've been around enough to know that it's the exceptional couple in these days that does not have real adjustments in getting married uh, on the question of how uh, leadership in the home is going to be carried out. So this is the background, and uh, I think that we should begin with prayer and also with some reading from the Word of God. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonders of your Word, of your love for us, for the privileges that you have given us of uh, living being in your image, of even uh, procreating, uh, giving life, and Father, we know that all of this is really very closely under your leadership, under your guidance, with your strength and your wisdom, and so we just cry to you that in these moments together we may hear your voice, each one in his place, with his needs, his problems, his situation, his partner, and Father, we believe you because you promised that they that follow you will not walk in darkness. And we just praise you that the steps of a good man are ordered by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that I work in French and somehow my one-track mind did not uh, think about bringing an English Bible. So uh, if I can borrow one. Uh, we're going to read, first of all, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, where we see God's order of authority. God has an order of authority in his universe, and uh, he has established an order here in our earthly setup. I read with, beginning with verse 3 in 1 Corinthians 11, now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. And there we have it. God the Father, Jesus Christ, man, woman. And this is the order established uh, by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Paul here. Now if you want to turn over to... Uh, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, we have another uh, brief passage on this, the end of the chapter, 
beginning with verse 11. Very strange words in a modern context. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent, for Adam was first was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived, it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be kept safe through childbirth if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. And then in First Peter, the third chapter. First Peter, the third chapter. I have this word to wives. How many fiancé do we have here today? Everybody's married. Okay. So we're talking to all the women here. Paul is, or Peter is. See, Paul is not the only one that's saying this. Some people say that Paul was a misogynist, that he was a woman hater. But uh, this comes from Peter too. Also, we know by this that Peter was uh, married, you see, even though he was the first pope. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, unbelievers, they may be won over without talk by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, and so on. And then verse 5. This is the way the holy women of the past put their hope in God and used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. <coughs> husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs together with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing hinders your prayers. Now, these are uh, typical passages from the scriptures, and I remember very well when I was doing my years of theology in Dallas Seminary, uh, and I was reading these passages and thinking to myself about the homes that I hoped uh, to have, and I can still remember how I thought about these verses. And I think about another uh, passage there in Ephesians where it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And then, wives, obey your husbands, respect your husbands, and so on. Well now, obviously I'm a man, and I must speak as a man here. But I want to say this to you, that I started... I started my married life as a pastor's son, as a theologian, a biblical theologian, as a pastor myself. I started with the idea that it was more important that my wife obey me than that I should love my wife. And somehow or other, Somehow or other, uh, I did not see that the verses that are written to wives are for wives, primarily. And that the verses that are written to husbands are primarily for husbands and should be very closely examined, digested, and obeyed by husbands. So I got off on the wrong foot. I got off on the wrong foot. Now, I believe with all my heart, that God gave my wife to me as the best woman I could have had. I think she believes, I'm very sorry she's not here today, I don't know how it happened. We usually do this together. I think she believes too that I am the man that was really God's man for her and that both of us have just what the other one needed to make a partnership that was complete and where each one would grow the maximum in the process of daily life. But I started as an authoritarian. I wasn't a mean, harsh authoritarian, but I still was an authoritarian. 
And I thought that it was my business to see that my wife obeyed me. And as I think back, I think that most of my theological friends and comrades in arms, they had this same idea. And this is really dynamite in the home. This is really dynamite in the home because it isn't the attitude that the Bible teaches at all. So uh, I want to start out by saying this from the masculine side and uh, by confessing my sins uh, so that you will know uh, how um, humiliated I was. And so the first seven years, we had a really, the first eight years, we had a really rough time. Really rough time. And I'm sure that my wife would have divorced me if she hadn't been a Christian. I'm sure she would have. And don't think by that that we had any big scenes. We didn't. I never struck my wife. Uh, but it just didn't work. And uh, so at the end of that time, I knew, I just knew that something was going to have to change. And one day, and I can still remember that day, I can still see the furniture in that room, I really got right flat down on my face before God, and I said, God, Whatever you want, you can have. If you want my wife to wear the trousers in our family, I'm willing that it would be that way. Whatever you say, I'm willing. All I want is to be sure that my home really glorifies you. Now, it took me over eight years to come to that place. But I can tell you this, that the moment that I did that, and I, it maybe won't be the same way with you at all. Maybe you're one of these husbands that was raised in a very congenial home and very easygoing home, and it's all been flowers and honey and so on. But uh, anyway, when I did that, as far as I was concerned, I had peace. And apart from two or three little skirmishes with the devil uh, afterward, uh, we never went back on that. It took some time. I don't know whether it was months or years. I'm quite sure it was years before my wife was really convinced that I had changed. <laughs> but uh, she did get convinced. <laughs> and I think she got peace. I think sometimes she still has some, uh, some difficult moments. But uh, anyway, uh, we're on an entirely different tempo now. And uh, I hope it's, uh, I'm convinced that it's the right one. And uh, so I hope you'll see that when I speak today, whatever I say is said from a context of great humiliation and real uh, uh, regret that my masculine pride and my, my masculine theology uh, could have led me so far down the road. But when I've said this, when I've said this, I want to say another thing, and that is, again, I'm sure God put me with my wife. Because I'm sure that my wife, who had been raised in the other kind of a home, which was the other extreme, that she needed somebody who really meant it. And she suffered a great deal. I suffered a great deal. I'm sure she suffered more than I did. But this was God's way of bringing us to real maturity, because both of us were off the track in our idea. And both of us had to get on the track, and both of us were very strong personality, and so it took somebody who was strong to uh, stand up to me, and it took somebody who was strong to stand up to her, you see? And the Lord knew that, and he put us together that way. And I hope it won't be that way with you. Did I hear an amen? <laughs> well, who leads? Who leads in the home? We're speaking about leadership in the home. Who leads in the home? We have the modern thought of equality. And there are some states and countries where I understand that there are laws on foot uh, by which uh, you will simply be united by a limited contract, three years, uh, and after that time, why well, you can decide to separate if you want to separate uh, after you've made the experiment and so on. 
And on this basis, both parties are perfectly equal and have full rights, whether it's uh, leadership, whether it's money, whether it's discipline, whether it's uh, patrimony or whatever it may be. Uh, you are two independent units that come together to do business. Now this is the limit to which uh, modern thought has gone and is going. It's going farther, I think. And so I think we have to recognize this is the case in our modern pattern. And many of us, many of us, I, I think that myself, I am, I am very deeply touched by this. Uh, I think we fool ourselves when we try to uh, believe that when we are completely surrounded by a certain atmosphere and, and ambiance, that we will not be penetrated and infiltrated by this. And I think that since this is the case, that we are infiltrated willy-nilly, we are penetrated by these ideas, then to a certain extent we have to compensate for this. Now, I remember that word of the Lord Jesus where he said that God gave divorce to the old Hebrew uh, people because of the hardness of their hearts. They had been so penetrated by Egyptian ideas about divorce and, about, and by the old world attitude toward divorce that they themselves had taken this in. And God himself even gave them the right to divorce because of their polluted ideas. And I think that if you are married to a modern woman and you are a modern man yourself, then quite possibly there will be some concessions to modern ideas. And God may even permit it. And if you should be married to a modern young woman, I won't mention any countries, but uh, I think all the countries are getting more and more that way, but some countries are more that way, we find in OM. And if you are married to a very modern young woman who has never known anything but this, I think that as a husband, you want to settle in advance for more moderate ideas, at least in the beginning, than you might have otherwise with someone who has been raised in a Darbyist home, or in a tight brethren home where the woman doesn't even pray with her husband. You see? So there is this modern thought that is opposed to the Bible thought that we have read about here in these various passages which present man as being the head of the house and the responsible one in the home. Now, I don't think I need to exegete these passages that we have read uh, if not to take them and to put them in practical uh, patterns and show how it works. Now, I don't think here either we're going to be able to say everything, but if I can just lay out five, perhaps five different lines, and then we can have questions. Because it's much better, I think, to exchange on your level. You probably all think, well, that old fossil, he lived in another generation. He probably doesn't know really anything about where we are living or thinking. Well, maybe you're right, but we'll try and see. <laughs> Human nature has not changed very much, by the way. Well, first of all, then, love is the responsibility of the husband. Love is the responsibility of the husband. This is a great and glorious word. I just one week ago married a young couple down in southwestern France, and just before the ceremony, the wife, the bride, came to me, and she was really very, very unhappy, upset, uh, because the families had insisted that the husband, especially the, the bridegroom, uh, cut his hair. He was one of the generation that still enjoys longer hair, you know. And uh, it was perhaps a little bit disorderly. But anyway, the family came in and said, no, you're getting married. This is one time in a lifetime. You must cut your hair. Well, the wife was very unhappy to think that 
you know, that the family would come in and force them on their great joyful day to do things. I think she had to cut and arrange her hair too. This was because they came from very conservative backgrounds. And already on their wedding day, why this business of love and acceptance, acceptance was going through its first strains. Love accepts. <coughs> love accepts. And here I want to take another leaf out of my own book. Uh, I was, uh, I entered marriage with the idea of an ideal woman. I remember Drina Furwer uh, talking to the wives not many years ago, and she said, you know, I was expecting to see a knight ride into my life. Dark, curly hair, blue eyes, shiny armor, beautiful horse, busy, everything. I got the blue eyes. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you this, most of American generation past had Hollywoodian ideas, you know, of the ideal husband or the ideal wife. And I came into marriage with the thought that, you know, if my wife wasn't like that, I would help her to become like the ideal person that I had hoped to marry, or thought I had. And so secretly I was pushing her along the road toward this ideal pattern. Well, that's murder. That is really murder. And it kills love. And unhappily, I think my wife was doing the same thing. She came from the same generation. And so instead of our both accepting one another fully with all our weaknesses, and there are plenty of them, why we were trying to make the other one over and this makes for constant constant criticism constant friction constant pressure constant irritation judging one another instead of loving one another so i would say the first point is mutual acceptance this is this this is the meaning of love if i really love my wife i take her as she is It'll take a little while to get used to some of the weaknesses, like, you know, leaving the, the uh, uh, cover on the, off the toothpaste, the tube, you know, and it runs out on that nice clean glass shelf, and, and uh, hubby who leaves his pajamas and everything else sprayed all over the floor. In this last in this wedding that I was in on uh, Saturday last, why they had a song, you know, about the two, the bride and the bridegroom, and they were recounting all the weaknesses of each one and they told how the bride herself she wasn't a good cook and how the uh, the husband the bridegroom why he always left his thing lying everywhere on the in the scenery you see uh, never picked anything up well uh, these are the things that you have to accept I have had to do sometimes with with wives who were very talkative and uh, you know, I mean, this just kind of makes me shrivel up inside. Uh, and I have thought to myself many times what a, what, how thankful I could be that since this is my nature, that my wife is also relatively quiet. But if I had married someone who was quite talkative, I would have had to, in the long run, I would have had to accept the fact that she was talkative when I'm, when I'm talkative too, you see. Acceptance, mutual acceptance, so important. Love accepts. And love talks, love communicates. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. God loved the world and gave his son. Love gives, and to give oneself. This is the greatest thing in love. It's the real exploration of the other person. And so there, there, there has to be communication. If I'm going to lead, then I must, the other person must know me, must know what I'm doing, must know in advance, you know? Like bringing home three or four brethren for dinner uh, without telling, you know, in advance how this happens. Of course, now in our modern day with the freezer, the deep freezer, why you can uh, sort of jerk things out of the, and the cans off the shelves and so on. But it still is a point. Uh, to remember. 
So love, love accepts and love communicates. This is the responsibility of the husband. Of course, it's the responsibility of the wife too. But as a leader, this is his responsibility. And love serves. Love serves. Christ said he loved the church, gave himself to the church. How did he give himself? Well, he said, I came not to be served, but to serve. I remember I was a captain in the army, and I still remember reading in the officer's manual uh, that the job of a captain is to see to it that all of his troop are taken care of before he thinks about himself. He sees that they're bedded down. He sees that they've got good food. He sees that the water is safe. He sees all to all these things. He is responsible for his troop. And I had a brother-in-law who went from private up to lieutenant colonel in the war. And I remember still going into his area there in uh, Nottingham, uh, England, just the, the night or so before D-Day and seeing how his men looked at him. He was like a mother to those men. And when he went around from, from one, uh, from one, uh, what, what do you call it? Um, one unit, from one unit. Well, they were, we were, this was war bases. Uh, as I went from one unit to another, he was an anti-aircraft, he had different batteries and so on. And uh, I, I could just tell when he walked into the area how these men really loved him because he served them. He really did what the manual said. He really took care of his men first and himself afterwards. And this is tremendous in, in marriage. Leadership, leadership serves. Leadership sees in advance. Leadership offers a positive program. We speak a lot about discipline in the home. Well, real discipline in the scriptures is not that. Real discipline is offering an overall positive program that, that takes care of the whole person. Training, encouragement, example, inspiration, delegation of authority, opportunity to serve, sharing, all these things. This is a part of what leadership is. And it's always with a thought for the other one, the maximum for the other. Now, of course, we're not built this way. I wasn't built this way. And when I came into marriage, I just had a tremendous amount to learn. Although at home, we had always been obliged. The boys did cooking, they cleaned the house, they did everything. We all knew how to work. But to serve somebody else, <laughs> that was not always as easy. And uh, so these are the elements uh, of the, the, the love that it says is the husband's responsibility. Loving and giving himself. Loving and giving himself. And of course, beyond all of this, and this is the thing that is so important, is the matter of one's own spiritual authority. I will have as much authority as I have spirituality. My real spirituality will gain the respect of my partner. If I don't have a respect, why then obviously my authority will be limited. And I think of a certain colonel that we had in our unit. I, I'm sorry, I used the arm. <laughs> but it's so apt, you know, the Bible speaks about the Christian soldier and so on. And uh, this colonel who was over our regiment, uh, I remember still hearing when we were in the Queen Mary going over to Britain just before D-Day. And the men were talking amongst themselves about how they were going to get this colonel by the rail and they were going to push him in. The drink. Because he was so sad. He was so sad. Business. Uh, and was one of the lessons along the road that showed me that it's what a man is that determines his real authority. Well, now this brings us to the other side, the woman's side, and that is that the Bible says that the wife is to respect her husband. And this is what a man needs. A woman needs love. She cannot stand it. She gets everything else but doesn't have love. She can't stand it. And a man, he cannot stand it if he doesn't have respect. 
A woman who doesn't respect her husband, she is down the drain. And I can just remember the first time that I went to Italy. And in that country, I found a, a brand of femininity that I had not seen before, except perhaps a little bit in the south of the United States, where women were really women, where women were really women. And there was something about their attitude toward men that just, that just made me feel really like a man. I really felt a man. And I've hardly found it anywhere else. And the last time I went to Italy, well, I found that it was going away. Modern thought is penetrating southern Italy, too. But I'll tell you this, that that really, that really made me realize to what extent I need, I need my wife's respect. I need my wife's real moral uh, spiritual support. Not support in the sense of saying, yes, you do it because Papa said so, but support in the sense of really looking to me as leader and expecting to receive from me all that I should bring. And knowing that I'll do it, being sure that I'll do it. Oh, that does something for a man. And I think it's one of the reasons that marriage is breaking down so terribly in the West today is that there are so few men who've ever known this. They have never been really put on their honor to do the maximum that God expects of them. Well, this is another side of things. Now, there are many other things we could say, but I think this opens up the subject. What are your questions? I try to just, you know, touch the some key points and stir up your pure imagination, your holy imaginations, and perhaps also to strike fire in those points where you are struggling. We're all struggling. I'm still struggling. I'm still learning. 71 years and a half, 41 years and a half married, and I'll tell you, I'm still learning. Even in my sex life, I'm still learning. So don't be disappointed or discouraged. In fact, this is the thrill of it. I can see the wheels are turning, but I don't hear anything coming out. Um, can you share with us some ways that you and your wife help develop your quiet time together and your spending time together? Well, as I said to you, I came out of an authoritarian Victorian home. And in our home, uh, we always read, had family worship together, and um, I'm sure that if the Lord had come, my father would have continued to the end of his prayer before he went up, you know. Um, <laughs> like that. And so I had very concrete, should I say, ironclad ideas about family worship. But I did modify them. Uh, In those first eight years, my wife and I, we did not have times together. Well, once the children came, we always read together and prayed together like that, but we did not have times together outside of the family worship time, uh, except uh, when there were some special subjects for prayer. But as the children have gotten older and gone now, why we, uh, while we had the children, we had singing, memorization, and it was, you know, it was always quite uh, uh, flexible for them. But uh, if you are in the Lord's work and you uh, have a time for yourself and you have a time for the children, if you have a third time with your wife uh, regularly, I think you will find oftentimes that you are really up to here. That was my experience. Now, before the children come, uh, there we were in a period of adjustment, and I think that I would have to say that we were still, to a certain extent, 
going by routines. As I said, my wife was 30 past when we married. Well, I was too. So we already had somewhat set ideas about, you know, we already had our patterns. I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to read and pray, and my wife was later, and she had her time later in the day and so on. And so we didn't come together like that. Now, why we, when we get up, uh, we have our breakfast, and then we have 20, 30, 40 minutes or an hour together according to the time we have and according to what day of the week it is, what we're praying for. Uh, and uh, we share, we have lists, we, we pray through our uh, list for the week and for uh, the Brethren Assembly missionaries that we are part of and so on. I'm afraid that's not a very inspiring uh, <laughs> contribution, but it was like that. Uh, we pray together. I wouldn't. I, I really love to pray with my wife. I uh, I feel that I pray better with my wife than with uh, anyone, or even better than with myself. So you mustn't think that this is, uh, you know, sclerosis. What do you say, sclerosis? It's not sclerosis uh, at all, but it came the hard way. I think that with many, many young Christian couples, they find it difficult if they are uh, mature. Uh, oftentimes they find it difficult to come together in the first time to really pray freely. I say that to you as a point of encouragement. This is, this is the, the news that I've gotten from a good share of the uh, Christian couples that I have known. This is also a discipline. It's also a matter of growth. Marriage is something that you start, you get born again when you're a Christian, you get born again when you become a uh, uh, husband and you get born again when you become a father and if you're a missionary then you got to get born again and become like the people you know what Paul said uh, to the Jews I became a Jew and so on and so you become you're born again if you're in Switzerland or wherever you're in Timbuktu and so here you are you're throwing four balls around in the air you know like a juggler and obviously some of them will fall now and then and it's a good thing to recognize that this is not abnormal Very good point. Now this verse is about practice. This is in the pastoral epistles. This is about practice in the church, incidentally. That's where the woman is not to teach or to take authority in public, you see. Uh, if you think about Aquila and Priscilla and how together they instructed Apollos, if you think about how Abraham and Sarah had it round and round about that first son Ishmael, you remember? And Sarah wanted to throw him out, and Abraham didn't want to do it. And Sarah is recommended in Peter as being submitted to her husband and calling him Lord. Uh, but in real life, this did not mean that she was like this. In real life, they exchanged. And this is also a part of love that you exchange. Now, if you've got a real sort of a dark idea about our first years in marriage, uh, we always talk together, my wife and I. We, I, I think I have made three decisions in my life, in my whole 41 years of married life, in which I went against my wife's uh, desires on any major issue. We always talked it all over together, and when I did, if I did go against it, it was only after we had had it all out, and uh, when I felt that something had to be done, and since I was the uh, last port of call, why I was the one who did it. But we always talked it all over together. And I think that this idea about the women being in silence does not mean that she is, you know, she just listened to Papa tell her what it's all about. And I think that it, this is what I was trying to say at the beginning of the hour, that in our modern day too, why uh, I think we as men have to recognize the fact that our wives come to us out of a background 
that had, does not have anything of this, even in the Christian circles. And in America, I don't know how it is in all the other countries, but in America, why there are some women's lib, evangelical women's lib, who are just pressing the, the, the right of women to preach and, and uh, you know, just to take the same place as men. Of course, I know that the Salvation Army, they've had this for years. Uh, but uh, taking these verses of Scripture and interpreting them other than we would interpret them. So I think we have to remember that we just can't leap from, uh, a, well, what do you say, the infiltration of unisex <laughs> to the uh, ideas of Scripture and practice them in full uh, just right out of hand. We would agree also uh, that uh, the practical implications of what Scripture teaches us would work itself out slightly differently for each couple. I think so. I think so. I think that I have a I have a sister-in-law who uh, always said, "My husband is the head of the house. He is the one who decides if we're going to go to if we're going to move to Italy. Why we, he decides that we talk about it, but he decides it. if he wants to go to Italy. If he thinks that's where God wants him, then I follow him. Well, when I came back from the war and I said to my wife, I had written to her about it beforehand. I had told her, you know, that I thought that God was leading us back to France." Uh, my wife had not been to war. She had not seen anything. And she said, uh, hey, we're 40 years old. We got two children. Look, what are you doing? And so we got down on our knees and we prayed that God would persuade my wife and lead my wife just as clearly as he had led me. That was the difference between my wife and her sister as far as wifehood and leadership is concerned. What time are we supposed to finish? Quarter past. Quarter past. Well, we still have a few minutes. Can you give it specific things that your wife does that makes you feel that she respects you? Hmm. She compliments me on my sermons when I ask her. <laughs> no, she she is very careful. She prepares lovely meals. When I go when I have picnics, she she really goes out of her way to see that they're the very best picnics. She does. Uh, she always is uh, careful to take care of my needs. If I'm going away and I go away often, do I have enough shirts that are pressed and? Uh, she takes care of her side of things and she sees to it that when I'm ready to go and what I've got things to do, why, uh, what, all that she can do about it is taking care of it. My wife is very quiet. She's a very independent person. And I don't think, I certainly don't want to give the impression of, uh, well, of anything negative, but My wife is not the kind of a person who is very quick to exteriorize uh, about anything. She, she doesn't even, she is so slow that she has never even gone in any place we've been toward other people to make friends. She makes friends when they come to her. And so uh, her respect for me, I'm sure, is deep, but it's not something that, that uh, is shown in in, in outward ways. So. And I must say this, I think that as, at the beginning, uh, she did not respect me. She did not respect me, and I think that in many ways I wasn't respectable. And that was why she didn't. And uh, uh, so uh, that is the things that she felt were, some of the things she felt were important. And uh, now, one thing, well, Take me a little time, you see. Uh, she uh, she comes to me for uh, uh, verification when she wrote this book on abortion. Why well, I really uh, helped her do practically all the, the scriptural part of it. She respects my knowledge of scripture and my judgment. If she has uh, if she has difficult cases that she's counseling, why well, she comes to me. Well, in most any case, to get my opinion on it. Uh, with the children, she would never do anything without consulting me. All these things. It takes me a few minutes to know the kind of never.
Yes, I think this is, uh, I think, personally, I'm sorry, I think this is horrible. I mean, there's nothing that really kills a man off like being uh, criticized or put down in front of others. This is just against all the laws of, uh, of home honor. I say that because I'm a man, you see, I'm sure that we should get some women to say now, uh, you know, how they feel about husbands who don't show their love. That would be a very helpful thing. How do you women, how do you women see um, the business of your husband loving you? How, how does he not show his love the way he should? Come on then. It's very hard to do this in public. This is like putting him down in public, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's very difficult when he was so into running, rush out, five dozen runs. <laughs> <laughs> This is one thing that I do consistently. I never buy a dozen anymore. They cost too much. <laughs> but very frequently, I buy at least one or two for my wife, especially when I'm coming home, they've been away. Just some little thing to show that I'm really thinking about her, that I want her to have something beautiful in her life. So, This didn't help the first eight years, though. When you say uh, all about the sex, does that mean you, you, you never question things about the world? No, but you never criticize. You never judge. Acceptance means that you don't have it against the other person because they do that. I have found that I can talk to my wife about the most difficult things if I take my time and wait until the Lord gives the opening and then you know I can talk about it in an objective way so that she knows that it's not because I don't like it that I'm talking to her but it's because I'm trying to help her and there are some things that I know are just built into my wife and that I cannot ever change and I don't fool with them I don't fool with them. Just like I know she sees some things in me that she knows she'll never change. She doesn't fool them. She lets them be. This is a part of acceptance. Is that what it means when it says treat your wife according to now? That's right. I think that until we go to our graves, we have to recognize that our partners will always have some things that we don't that, that, that represent a lack toward us. I think that many, now I'm, I'm saying this as a man because I am a man, you see, but you women, you can say the same thing the other way around. It's not because I think that the women are particularly bad. I think that many of my generation, women of my generation were prudish. They were raised with sex as a taboo and they could never really open up on sex. And they could never really fully give themselves. When my daughter got married, that was one of the things that I said to her just before the marriage. Honey, I said, be sure that you give yourself 100% care. No reserve. No Cover up. No holding them. And I think, I think that in that sense, that there are probably many women who, down to the end of their days, never can really fully give themselves. And I know that to this very day, there are some things in me that I, well, I would never be able to discuss with my wife. I just wouldn't be able to. I don't think she could understand them. I don't think that I could ever get them out in the open and talk about them. I'm just, I'm just not made that way. <coughs> I was raised otherwise. And it's, it's like cement. And God can help. God can help. But uh, I, think, <laughs> I think it's a smart thing, at least to know that this is a possibility, and not to battle any... 
in a futile fashion with, with these things. Well, I couldn't be absolutely sure about that. Uh, I would certainly say that my wife and I are opposites. We are tremendously opposites. But we both have the same standards and the same principles and the same goals and the same uh, pattern of life. And so we're, we're very much one. One more question. Yes, I think so. The things that the Bible says are very substantial. They are very brief, but they are really potent. And you will ignore them to your own loss. When it says these little things like, husbands love your wives, don't be bitter against them, or these things, it's because these touch on real, crucial, constantly returning problems in very dumb. They're inspired. Well, uh, I think we better uh, wrap it up. Certainly appreciate your contributions. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, if you feel that I could help you from what we have said, uh, in private, well, I'd certainly be glad. Uh, you women, if you want to go to my wife, you'll find her a very understanding, uh, experienced person. <laughs> Pray. Father, how we love thy family, how we love this freedom that you give us, this uh, liberty to walk with you, to walk together with you, and how we appreciate your Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth, even about marriage. And Lord, we do want to learn not to be idealists, but to be biblicists, to be real followers of your word, and not letter men, but spirit men and women. We just praise you for all that you have given us, praise you for our partners, for our children. We pray that we may be fully open to what you say to us and to helping others. In Jesus' name, amen.